Welcome to Classic Paranormal, where we bring you true stories of the weird, strange, and otherworldly from works of literature from the past that time forgot. Don't forget to hit the share button to help promote this podcast. This is episode 3 of Hamlin Garland's 40 Years of Psychic Research, first published in 1936. Chapter 7. I Command Spirits Soon after the conclusion of this series of experiments with Mrs. Smiley, I gave up my apartment in Boston and returned to the Middle West. With Chicago as my literary headquarters, I spent a large part of my summers with my father and mother in West Salem, Wisconsin, or in the Rocky Mountains. This abandonment of Boston as a place of residence took me out of the active management of the Psychical Society, but I continued my researches and from time to time sent in a report of my experiments. The World's Fair, which was just closing, had brought to the city not only a throng of artists and literary men, but a swarm of religious teachers of all sorts. Among them were many mediums who were paying their way at the fair. From time to time I went in search of these who had been recommended to me by those of my friends who, despite the noise and confusion of the city, had maintained their interest in the spirit world. For the most part I heard these magicians chanting their spells in mean dwellings on the south side or over in the still humbler streets of the west side. At each guarded door I was called upon to transfer a dollar from my pocket to the palm of the doorkeeper, but I did not allow this to prejudice me. Mediums must eat and be clothed. I cannot blame them for dramatizing and selling their powers wherever they are. An honest medium has a perfect right to charge for her time and energy. I made no formal report on these experiences for reason that by contrast with what I had already sent in they seemed trivial or dubious. One curious fact I did report to Flower. Quote, not one of all these mediums, good or bad, had the slightest clairvoyant clue to my name or my purpose. I sat obscurely and quietly in the back row of chairs, and whenever they had occasion to address me, they called out, the gentleman in the third seat of the last row. Never once did any sitter or psychic clairvoyantly discover that I was connected with the Psychical Society. End quote. Some years after the fair, I chanced to be lunching with John M. Judah in the University Club of Indianapolis, and in the course of our conversation, my host remarked, by the way, you should know Henry Wallace, a brother of General Lou Wallace. He's deeply interested in psychical matters and might be able to recommend a medium. This suggestion led me to ask for an introduction to Mr. Wallace, and at the close of our luncheon, Judah took me around to his office, presented me, and retired. Mr. Wallace was willing to talk of his experiences and in reply to my question, do you know of a good medium in the city, instantly replied, yes, I know of one who is a wonder. She lives within 10 minutes ride of this office. You should see her. She's not only a slate writer, but also a trumpet medium of extraordinary power. I should like to try her this afternoon. I'm always ready for further experiment on the physical side. Very well, now this is my suggestion. I'll drive you to the street just this side of the cottage and drop you there. I've had many sittings with her, and it won't do to let her see you with me. She must not know your name or how you came to knock at her door. His plan appealed to me, and as he was prepared to carry it into immediate execution, we went down to his buggy, this was before the days of motor cars, and set forth. As we drove along, he continued his instructions. Don't take no for an answer. Just say I've come for a sitting. She's a queer old body, illiterate and notional. She'll lie you sharply, but she needs your dollar, and if you insist, we'll surely let you in. Halting at a row of wooden houses, he pointed to one in the middle of the block, a small drab two-story cottage. She lives there. As I knocked on the designated shabby portal, I heard inner doors opening and shutting and at last the face of a faded middle-aged woman came into view. She was gaunt, dark-complexioned, and sad, plainly of the southern mountaineer type as Wallace had described her to be. She studied me through the half-open door while I explained that I'd come a long way for a sitting and that this was my only hour. I'm a stranger here, and I'm leaving Chicago on the night train. She held the door to a narrow opening, listening with grim impassivity, her big dark eyes appraising me. That she considered me a possible enemy was evident, but I explained that I had heard of her wonderful work and that I couldn't think of leaving without a sitting with her. She appeared to be listening to some in her voice rather than to mine, and at last she hoarsely and grudgingly said, Come in. Nothing in the hall into which she led me suggested that she was a female Houdini, earning large sums of money by trickery. Her dress indicated that she was her own housekeeper, and her hands were those of a toiler to whom a silver dollar was a large piece of money. She was wearing a long apron and had the distraught air of a cook who, having been called away from the making of a pie, resents it. She was tall, bent, hollow-eyed, and sallow, a type of womanhood I had often seen in the South, a reticent, infinitely patient and enduring family drudge. Her eyes were her best feature, and as she gained confidence in me, her face took on a certain nobility. Her brow smoothed out, and she answered my questions regarding her psychic powers with the air of one who is perfectly certain of her ability to meet any tests. 
To think of her worn out stiffened hands playing tricks with a slate was ludicrous. Leading me into her parlor with its cheap golden oak furniture upholstered in yellow plush, she gave me a seat at a small center table which stood in the light of the bay window. This stand was covered with a chenille lambrequin, I believe that is the proper name, which came down on all sides nearly to the floor. So far as I could discover, we were alone in the house. I heard no sounds other than those we made. It seemed foolish to expect anything marvelous in such pitiful surroundings. The little room was flooded with direct afternoon sunlight. I'd brought with me a pair of folding cloth-edged school slates, and these I laid on the table, making no demand for any specific message. I merely said, let's see what happens. The medium put a tiny piece of pencil between the slates and thrust them under the table in the usual way. She said, hold one end of them. I made no objection to this at the moment, but determined to have my own way later. Almost immediately, a volley of snapping sounds arose from the slates, sounds which resembled the creaking of a cane-seated rocking chair. These noises were followed by three loud taps indicating a completed message, and when she withdrew the slates and opened them, I found the inner sides filled with messages, all addressed to Henry Wallace. This interested me keenly, much more than any message addressed to me. It was evident that while she could get nothing of me, could not even derive my name or business, she could sense and did sense in me something associated with Wallace. It was as if I'd brought in my clothing the scent of his pipe, or to be more mystical, something of his aura. Another possible explanation is that his many sittings with her had left in her room a psychic influence which still dominated her. Her guides were equally helpless. This fact in itself is valuable. At my request, we tried again, holding the slates under the table as before with our right hands while our left hands remained in full sight on the tabletop. As the writing began again, she called my attention to a twitching of the muscles of her left hand and arm. A series of minute movements which kept time, so to say, with the pecking sounds on the slates beneath the table. This synchronism profoundly interested me. It made certain that some occult relationship between her normal arm and the writing going on below was in operation. The sound of writing was still heard as she slowly withdrew the slates. After they were laid on the table, the ticking noise could still be heard. Reaching over, she took the upper slate by the corner with her thumb and finger, and slowly lifted it while the phantom fingers continued to write at a furious rate. The pencil point seemed to be hopping up and down, pecking out its lines. This noise coming from the slates reminded me of the sizzling of fat in a frying pan when the cook lifts the cover to turn the meat. Putting my head down flat on the table, I tried to catch a glimpse of the pencil at work, but failed. As she opened the slates wider, the noise ceased. The messages were again disappointing. They had no relation to me, none whatever. The spirits had not yet discovered me. This was an excellent test of power for the reason that the psychic had opened the slates to the sunlight. There was no machinery, no hocus pocus, no chance for mistake. It happened as I related, wholly under my eyes and with no third person present. But there was no clairvoyant power at work. At this point, I decided to take control. I said to her, I am myself a psychic. It is not necessary to place the slates under the table. Lay them down on the top. I want to put my hand on them. She did this. I then said, now put your right hand above mine. She did as I commanded with wondering submissiveness and with my left hand I flung the end of the long table cover over our two hands in the slates, thus shutting away the light. Her meek compliance in this test surprised me. She accepted my suggestion as a command from an older and more powerful practitioner. She showed no hesitation, no doubt of the outcome, and I confessed to a sense of newfound power as I felt the writing begin under my hand. My success amazed me, but I gave no sign of it. The psychic again called my attention to the multitudinous twitchings in her left hand and wrist. Her fingers were drawn and tense, curved like the claws of an eagle, and the muscles in her thin forearm moved convulsively. Her hands, I may add, were knotted and calloused by toil, having nothing of the smooth deftness of a conjurer. To credit her with prestidigitation or hypnotic power would have been absurd. She was in my control. While the writing was thus going on, phantom fingers darted out below the fringe of the table cover and touched me on the knees with lightning swiftness. Motions impossible for the medium's work-worn hands which were fully accounted for on the top of the table. Speaking to the invisibles, I said, Show me your arm. Shake me by the hand. Wallace told me that he often had this done for him, but I could not induce the spirit hands to do more than touch me. The critic may say they were the medium's toes, but I am quite certain that they were hands for I saw them. During this time, the psychic did not speak a word. She gazed at me expectantly. I had become the wonder worker. Let me repeat. This test took place in a sunlit room while I was in full control of the conditions. I assert that a miracle as inexplicable as any in an oriental story now took place.
for on opening the slates I found them filled with messages. To have writing appear on closed slates under my own hands is as mysterious in its way as the East Indian conjurer's momentary development of a mango tree. In this case, the wizardry came from a gaunt middle-aged housewife at my command. That some of the messages came from her I have no doubt, for they were badly spelled and badly written, but others were beyond her knowledge or skill in penmanship. My unexpected success so wrought upon me that I decided upon a supreme test. As a matter of fact, I said with quiet assurance, it is not necessary for either of us to touch the slates. We need not even cover them. Put them down on the tabletop and lean back in your chair. You and I are a powerful battery. We can do anything. Without the slightest hesitation, she did my bidding. Settling back in her chair, she fixed her eyes on the slates, which were lying in full sight in the center of the table. We had but a moment to wait. The sound of writing began at once and went on with greater power and speed than when our palms were on the slates. The medium's hands were in her lap, fully two feet from the table's edge and in clear daylight. I was bent above the slates, listening. On opening the slates, I again found them filled with writing. No demonstration of supernormal writing could have been more absolutely convincing, but none of the messages were related to me. One was a letter addressed to Wallace and signed Joseph Jefferson. Another script bore the signature Lou Wallace. Several of the previous messages had been poorly written and phonetically spelled, quite as the psychic herself would write them and spell them but these two final messages were dashingly written and boldly signed. In short, the method was convincingly supernormal, and the messages impossible to the unlettered psychic. Such was my report, written and signed that afternoon. Those two signatures of Jefferson and Wallace must be minutely reckoned with. They remain wholly inexplicable, for if we grant that the psychic and I had the power of reproducing on a slate wholly without contact the signatures of two famous Americans, how is it that she had no knowledge of me? She knew that I came for a test, but nothing more. Why should she confuse me with Henry Wallace, a man not in the least like me? That she had no hint of my name or of my work was evident. Whatever her powers, she was not a mind reader. She did not associate me with the American Psychical Society. Furthermore, Jefferson and Lou Wallace themselves were not clairvoyant. They did not address themselves to me. If the doubter says, you were deceived, nothing is so deceptive as our senses. I again reply, very true but they are all we have. I controlled all the conditions. I dictated all the methods. I shared the entire process. What more could I ask? The psychic, now wholly convinced that I was a powerful fellow practitioner, suggested that we go to her dark room and try for voices. We'll work the trumpet, she said. Her seance chamber, which was on the second floor of the stairs, had but one door. It was hardly more than a large closet and was lighted with a single gas jet. It contained nothing but two wooden chairs and a small stand. The floor was bare and its one high window was filled with a lightproof shade. The door had an inner sliding bolt which I myself shot into its staple after the psychic had lighted the gas and taken her seat. On the floor beside the chair in which she seated me stood three tin trumpets. They were all of equal size and about two feet tall. At her suggestion I placed a chair directly in front of hers and turned out the lights. As I took my seat my knees were touching hers. At first the darkness was complete but in a few minutes I was aware that under the badly fitting door a band of sunlight glowed increasingly. This fact is important and I ask the reader to bear it in mind. After singing with the psychic one or two hymns, I sat at ease and in watchful silence. Suddenly, the cones which stood near my right elbow began to jostle one another. Leaning toward the psychic, I said, Give me your hands. Without a moment's hesitation, she held out both her hands and I took them firmly in mine. I then said, I want to put my toes on yours. She granted this test as readily as the other, and while I thus controlled her feet and hands, one of the cones rose from the floor and began to circle the room. I could see it plainly as it floated above my head, for it reflected the light from the threshold. Its lower side shone like a golden rod. For several minutes it roamed the room, up near the ceiling, like a huge dragonfly. At last it came down and rested on my shoulder. After a moment of pause it moved slowly round before my face. With both my hands still grasping those of the psychic, I bent my head and touched the cone with my forehead. Instantly it fell, as if my touch had in some way short-circuited its power. A little later, when the psychic struck a light, another cone fell from its position in the air. It had also been in motion, although I had not been able to see it. It may be that all three of them had been afloat at one and the same moment. Again, while I held the psychic's hands and put my toes on hers, one of the cones swept into the air and circled about our heads. It moved horizontally as if floating on a liquid. It touched me again and again, always with the gentlest precision. The light from beneath the door now made it seem like a shaft of firelit copper. 
Voices appeared to come from the cones, but as they were all colored by the vernacular of the psychic, I did not value what they said to me. I could not relate them to any other personality. Not one of them had any message for me. Not one of the invisibles spoke my name. Nevertheless, the physical side of this performance was highly satisfactory. The cone soared at moments when the psychic was under my rigid control, but I observed a very curious fact. The voices did not come while I held her hands. In stating this, I am far from saying that she could not have produced the voices while I controlled her hands. As a performance, it was one of the most marvelous of all my experiences up to that date. In characterizing the psychic as a hard-working housewife and in describing her shabby little home, I hope to aid the reader in visualizing the commonplace surroundings in which this wonder-working woman wrought. For two dollars, she had presented more inexplicable phenomena than any conjurer could offer with his guarded stage, his black curtains, his wires, his mirrors, and his black-robed attendants. It may be that I helped to produce these phenomena. Certainly, I dictated the method of their working out. My only sensation of sharing the process was a shudder which ran over me at certain moments of the seance. This may have been purely physical. As I was going away, I heartily clasped the psychic's hand. You and I together could rival the work of any mediums in the world. By doing things in my way, we brought new forces into action, didn't we? For the first time, she smiled, a faint smile, and said rather wistfully, We certainly did. I hope you'll come and try again. I like to work with you. That I shall do, I replied. I shall come again soon, and will perform new marvels. I never did, and I fear that she is now herself an invisible. If she is, I await a message from her. I cannot recall her name, but if she comes, she will be able to identify herself. The value of this experience cannot be overstated. It demonstrated once again that mediums do not know the scope of their own powers. They fall into grooves of action. They are reluctant to try new ways of procedure, and their inhibitions limit their activities. Most of the mediums I have examined would not permit me to divert the action of their guides nor to override their advice, but in this case I had the fullest freedom of arrangement and control. I was apparently a part of the show. My experience that day strengthened me in the belief that these parasitic personalities are built up by the psychic inner circle, and that they can be influenced, taught to act in new ways by a stronger will than that of the medium. Wallace was waiting for me, eager to learn the outcome of my sitting. Well, how was it? Did it work? perfectly, amazingly. It was a marvelous experience, but it did not at any time demonstrate clairvoyance. Did you find out who you were? No. That is the most puzzling part of the whole seance. All messages were absolutely supernormal in the method of their production, but they had no reference to me. They were all addressed to you. The medium gained no hint of my name or of my official purpose. She showed no clairvoyance or telepathic ability, not the slightest. Wallace stared at me in amazement, the messages referred to me? Yes, and to be quite fair, two of them were signed Lou Wallace and Joseph Jefferson in a dashing individual script, quite impossible to the medium. Others were badly written and wrongly spelled, as I imagined she would write and spell. Wallace slowly replied, I have always found her honest. So did I, and I believe in her. She is a plain, hard-working housewife. She came out of her kitchen to work these miracles for me, and when I left, I have no doubt she put on her apron and went back to her stove. But what shall we say of her failure to discover my name? Shall we say that she and her guides had no divining power? Furthermore, Jefferson had some knowledge of me, and if death is added to his clairvoyant powers, why would he address me as if I were you? Is it possible that he could not see me or feel me in any way? General Wallace was equally unperceiving. We came to no agreement concerning these inconsistencies, but I went away enriched by a most valuable discovery. I had discovered that I too could command spirits of the vasty deep and they would obey. Apparently, my will, up to a certain point, had been dominant. There is an element of absurdity in the slate writing, I am free to confess, but we should not let that interfere with the sense of its essential mystery. Women of this type follow precedent in their experiments. Having seen others write upon closed slates, they adopt the same method of procedure. They are eager for results, for messages, and they are not curious about processes. They keep to the well-trodden path. The theory of the folded slates is that they furnish a dark cabinet in which the forces work more easily. The slates are put under the table to shield the spirits from observation while at work, believers explain. But the doubters say, for purposes of fraud. In my case, I had broken up both these traditional practices. I had obtained the writing on the slates without contact and on top of the table. Furthermore, we must reckon with the fact that the messages thus produced could not have been written by the psychic. She could not have imitated those signatures with her free hand and I doubt if she could have spelled the words. I had probably seen Jefferson's signature many times, but I could not have imitated it. 
I leave the puzzle with my readers. Chapter 8. Theories and Methods Interest in psychical experiment seems to go in waves or cycles, and the years lying between 1895 and 1903 were unproductive in America of any notable developments. The Boston Psychical Society slowly disintegrated. Our journal died, and the arena, the friend of all reformers and new thought organizations, passed out of Flower's hands. I still kept in touch with him and with Dolbear, but I met them only at long intervals. Then, too, my literary work subordinated all matters occult. For more than two years, 1895 to 1897, I was busied with writing a life of General Grant. In 1898, I took the Long Overland Trail through the Northwest Wilderness into the Upper Yukon Valley. In 1900, I began a series of novels dealing with the Red Men and their neighbors, writing which kept me on the move and in the open. Consideration of psychic problems was curtailed. Nevertheless, when opportunity offered, I kept tryst with certain of my invisible friends and monitors. I recall sharing some of Professor Quackenbush's experiments in hypnosis, and somewhere about 1903, Mrs. Smiley, who was visiting Cleveland, gave me several additional sittings, sittings in which only one other person was present. The first date chanced to be on a very warm night, and the room in which we sat was small and uncomfortably close. To Mrs. Smiley, who was ten years older and considerably less powerful, I said, I shall not count it against you if we fail of voices tonight. After putting her under control, as I had so often done, I heard almost immediately the voice of Mitchell, who greeted me as if we had parted but the day before. Speaking from the trumpet, he said, I am glad to greet you again, Mr. Garland. I have read your reports on our tests, and I commend you for holding an even hand over the evidence. To change my figure of speech, we prefer that you should lean a little backward when pronouncing judgments. Your words will then carry more weight with the scientific world. Wilbur then took the horn and joked with me precisely as he had done ten years before. He had not changed in age or character, apparently. His most serious sentence was a hope that I would continue my work. Stick to it. We're depending on you. Nothing essentially new developed during the two following sittings. They only confirmed what I had previously recorded. But Mrs. Smiley promised to stop in Chicago on her way west and sit for me in my own home. In anticipation of a lively seance, I invited Mr. and Mrs. Robert Milliken to join our circle. Alas, it was another smotheringly hot night, and Mrs. Smiley, tensely eager to impress Professor Milliken, failed entirely. She went away heartsick over her failure and my disappointment. I never again had an opportunity to meet with her. Although various public mediums in Chicago were commended to me, I did not follow up the suggestions. I had been so fortunate in my work with non-commercial, self-sacrificing psychics that sitting through the conventional, not to say traditional, dark circle of miscellaneous sitters seemed a waste of time. I kept up my reading, however, and now and again tried out an experiment with a friend. Some of these experiments, while of no evidential value, not only made me aware of the latent mediumistic power which many of my friends possessed, but convinced me that my own ability to develop this power and make use of it was increasing rather than diminishing. Impromptu sittings yielded curious and in some cases alarming results. It appeared that any group of people sitting regularly with me for a week or two would almost certainly develop from their circle a medium and a guide. If America during these years was laggard in the scientific study of psychic phenomena, France, Italy, and England were not, for they were all sending to us year by year reports, essays, and books which recorded scores of colorful experiments and scholarly and precise wording. In 1905, a journal called the Annals of Psychical Science with an international board of directors established a London office and began publication in English of reports of the work which was being carried on in several European laboratories. The directors of the enterprise were Dr. Dariu and Professor Shaw Rocher and the advisory committee headed by Sir William Crookes included Camille Flammarion, astronomer, Caesar Lombroso, distinguished alienist, Enrico Morselli, professor of psychology, Dr. Joseph Maxwell, a French deputy, and other men of high repute as physicists and psychologists. It appeared from these reports that certain universities of France and Italy were taking up the study of mediumship as they would examine any other problems of biology, whereas no American university professor would publicly admit that the phenomena existed. One of my most intimate friends at this time was Henry Blake Fuller, the Chicago novelist, who was not only a man of wide reading along lines of philosophical discussion, but an enthusiast on all phases of Italian life and history. He often translated for me articles dealing with experiments in Milan or Rome. French reports I was able to read for myself, and I was delighted to find my own deductions confirmed by detailed reports in the Annals of Psychical Science. As I read, I discovered to my joy that one scientific investigator commended me to another, Crooks led to Zollner, Zollner to Maxwell, Maxwell to Morselli, all of whom treated mediumship as a human attribute, something to be calmly studied and precisely reported. Science is a method, not a dogma, they said. 
With their laboratory experimentation, a new nomenclature came into use. In place of etheric limbs and astral bodies, I began to read of ectoplasmic hands and ectoplasmic phantasms. In fact, these professors carefully avoided the use of the word medium, substituting psychic or sensitive, by which they intended to indicate an individual who had developed supernormal perception or supernormal energies. According to these thinkers, there was no such thing as supernatural agency or event. Every phenomenon, no matter how puzzling, is a part of nature and subject to natural law, they declared. Quote, Phenomena may be for the moment inexplicable, but never above or beyond nature. Agencies can be supernormal, but not supernatural. End quote. More and more of these investigators adopted the hypothesis that the psychic and his sitters working together were the main cause, some said the sole cause, of physical as well as mental phenomena. Words like metaphysical were supplemented by metapsychical to indicate that they were dealing with unknown psychical laws, just as the metaphysical phenomena were inexplicable to known physical laws. In the conduct of these scientific seances, all prayers, hymns, and inspirational addresses were excluded. The phraseology as well as the methods of the seances tended to become those of the laboratory. Theories waited on experiment. In all this, Fuller and I rejoiced. In no other way can we get at the fundamental facts involved, he argued. I doubt if they can ever make these experiments yield unvarying results as in chemistry, but they can come near to predicting phenomena. From the earliest attempts at scientific observations and experiment in 1855, writers on these subjects had agreed that a subtle form of matter impalpable and intangible emanated from the medium, and in lesser degree from each person in a seance. These substances were called by early writers odic force, psychode, etheric fluid, and various other names. Later observers testified that it was this semi-luminous and exceedingly subtle exudation which caused objects to be moved, and that from it all phantasmal bodies were built up. Ectoplasm was the later name for this mysterious element. This word was formed from the prefix ecto, meaning outside, and plasm, which biologists use to describe the vital contents of body cells. This substance, writes one observer, takes on several colors, gray, white, and blue. It is excessively mobile. It often resembles smoke, but easily becomes viscous. It is sensitive, and its sensibility is confounded with that of the psychic. A bright light upon it gives pain to the psychic. It has an immediate irresistible tendency to simulate a body of some sort and remains but an instant in its original misty vaporous shape. With the rapidity of thought it forms itself into heads, hands, and faces. It has no means of defending itself. It is like a timid animal. It retreats for protection back into the body of the psychic. It can move upward as well as downward. It produces organs complete in themselves, ephemeral though they are. Sometimes it exudes from the body of the psychic as a vapor and settles on her dress like hoarfrost, thus forming an apron of white, out of which a head or face may appear. Everything goes to show that this substance is the material of the medium partly externalized. It exists. It has been photographed. The feet which it forms have left their print on wax and supernumerary hands built of it have been molded in paraffin. It is the primary substance into which the grub melts in his dark cabinet and from which he emerges a gorgeous butterfly. The thinker concludes with these words, quote, This elementary substance can be molded by the mind of the psychic or by the thought of the sitter as a sculptor models wax. End quote. According to reports in the Annals of Psychical Science, experimenters with improved cameras had caught and reproduced these ectoplasmic forms as they issued from the body of the psychic and had thus recorded their growth and dissolution. As a result of these experiments, analysis shifted from the medium as a supposed telephone between the dead and the living and centered upon a study of his body and his brain as dynamos teeming with unknown and immeasurable rays of biochemical energy. From the worship of a medium as the basis of a new religion, these relentless European students of biological fact began to test his capacities in a laboratory. These interpretations ran harmoniously with my own experiments and observations at the time. And so far from diminishing my interest in psychic phenomena, this new theory made each sensitive of still more absorbing interest. It also caused me to resent the sneers and evasions of my own university professors and specialists. Why should not American colleges enter this field of unexplored biology as they are doing in France, Italy, and Germany, I said to Fuller. It is not a religious problem with Roche or Lombroso. It is a question of fact. Are these supernormal powers claimed by individual psychics demonstrable? That should be the question with American men of science. Our scientific experts are afraid of criticism, he replied. They can't afford to lose the goodwill of their employers. In America, our best-known investigator at this time was William James, but he, like Oliver Lodge, was exceedingly cautious in affirmative statement. 
Richard Hodgson, the American secretary of the English Society, was not connected so far as I knew with any academic laboratories and was collecting evidence rather than producing it. One or two commissions had been appointed to put an end to mediumship, and from time to time their chairman called upon the psychics to come forward and be exposed. But as no one had volunteered, the commissioners soon used up their funds, retired into oblivion. They were not patient truth seekers, they were bent upon discrediting spiritualism. Reading the annals of psychical science emphasized the fact that spirit phenomena are of like character all over the world, and that patient practitioners had been able to name the conditions which should govern all experimental seances. Some of these I had discovered for myself. 1. Use a small room. 2. Sit regularly in a circle. 3. See that all the sitters are comfortable. 4. Use a plain wooden table and plain chairs. Double top tables give best results. 5. A bare floor is best. 6. Have only 6 or 8 people in the circle, men and women in equal numbers, and do not change the personnel. 7. Begin with a dark room or dim light. Green or yellow or red light is less antagonistic to the psychic force than white light. 8. Don't argue. Anything which irritates or disturbs the medium or any member of the circle will prevent results. Sing or converse quietly. 9. Have only one spokesman. Many questions at once confuse the situation. Consult the guides as to conditions. 10. Don't get impatient. Count on sitting two hours and have at least ten sittings before rendering judgment concerning the powers of the medium. As my readers will recall, I had already applied most of these rules and some of them I had successfully contravened. My best seances had been only with three or four sitters, as in Dolbear's study in Flower's chamber. In some instances I had humored the psychic, in others, I had insisted on doing things in my own way. Very early in my experimentation, I had discovered that comfort and serenity were necessary in order that the psychic should be at her best. A sitter's skeptical attitude of mind has little effect on the phenomena, provided he keeps his doubts to himself and does not irritate or distract the psychic. Each circle is in fact a kind of chemical compound. Any new personality adds another element which may increase the force or diminish it. When approached for advice by those about to form a circle, I usually replied in these words, or near it. Phenomena seem to be the result of a mixture of chemistry and personalities. Faith is not essential to successful experiment, but patience and good temper are. Whatever the cause of the phenomena, their production seems to be a severe physical strain. Treat your medium with kindly care. Having control of all the conditions, eliminate all chance or trickery by gradually covering every loophole in your investigation. Make each succeeding sitting an affirmation or verification of the others. Mediums are highly suggestible. They work best when the circle is harmonious. Some of them succeed only when their routine is rigidly followed. Others can be induced to experiment. Nearly all of these gifted individuals consider their power a sacred gift, something to be used for consolation or for conviction of others. Some use it to make a living, but do so with the advice of their guides. You will gain best results by gaining the confidence of these wonder workers. Only in very exceptional cases will mediums lend their power to aid in the advance of psychic science. In fact, I do not expect it of them. Although constantly beset by those who wished me to aid in these developing circles, I declined to do so. It was too tedious and too uncertain of results. Then too, the difficulty of meeting regularly and with the same persons in the circle was a barrier. Although I sometimes took charge of such sittings for the entertainment of guests, I did so reluctantly. I could not afford to spend long hours getting faint raps on a chair or slight movements of a table. For nearly ten years, I continued my search for another co-laborer like Mrs. Smiley and Mrs. Simpson, one who would lend herself wholeheartedly to a series of experiments and so bring me a little nearer to an understanding of the mystery of mediumship. Accepting the biodynamic theory which leading investigators in the years following 1900 used as a working hypothesis, I resumed my experiments. Respecting the belief of the mediums that their guides were persons, I consented to advise with Coulter and Wilbur, or whatever the guide's name happened to be, but I drew the line at Red Thunder or White Bird. I knew too much about the speech and character of the Red Men to parley with these traditional figures. I regarded them as survivals of a primitive method of experiment. Trance controls may be dream creations, I argued, and all mediumship only impersonation, in the one case through the body, in the other by ectoplasmic forms but nothing is gained by arguing the point with any psychic. Most of the mediums I met were enslaved to those dream personalities, implicitly obeying their commands. Some said, we are forbidden by our guides to make money. They fix our hours and define the methods of our sittings. Considering their guides supremely wise, they sought their advice on all perplexities. 
The personality of the spirit manifesting must be discovered by exploration of the psychic, European investigators declared. The problem is biological, and the study of error is also essential to an understanding of these metapsychical phenomena. In this exploration, we must expect to come upon absurd acts. The old world advance into this field of unknown biology was not paralleled in America. Our researchers gave no thought to Roche and Maxwell or Barak, or if they did, they regarded them as dupes or dreamers. Even my friend Dolbear, who had confessed to me his complete inability to explain the phenomena which he had witnessed in his own study, felt obliged to hedge in the presence of his associates. America had no scientific men of the stature and boldness of Crooks, Lodge, and Wallace. No American of high renown came forward to study this most vital problem, although Tesla and Edison both privately hinted that there was something real in psychic phenomena. Edison once said to a friend of mine, All along the way I've come upon hints of these mysterious forces, and sometime I'm going to stop commercial inventing and follow out these leadings. This he never found leisure to do. The truth is, our professors were not only afraid of losing face, as the Chinese say, they were afraid of losing faith in what they had gained. Orthodox biology has no place for a study of metaphysical phenomena. Professors who are quick to accept new facts in chemistry rage against the words metapsychical and metaphysical. In the presence of a psychic, they cease to be men of science and become bitter antagonists of a theory of which they know nothing. My only hope was that of finding a few young men who could not be intimidated by a board of regents or overawed by their fellow instructors. I sympathized with the scornful psychologist who said, I refused to be bored by a lot of old women singing hymns in the dark to make a table dance. But I resented sweeping denials of the existence of such phenomena. Granting that these inexplicable phenomena sprang from forces originating in the psychic inner sitters, I realized that time must be allowed for development. Challenging some of my most distinguished scientific friends, I said, if you will join me in a series of ten seances, making no audible comment in the presence of the other sitters, I will amaze you as Dolbear was amazed. It can't be done with one sitting. Perhaps not in five. But in the end, you will be forced to grant the reality of the phenomena upon which I am willing you should put your own interpretation. No one volunteered. They were all willing to sit patiently through a hundred barren experiments in physics, but refused to give a moment's open-minded thought to my report of the writing on a closed slate under control. They did not call me a liar when I told them of my tests, but they considered me a dupe. You were hypnotized. Such things can't happen. They are opposed to all physical laws, to all known physical laws. These phenomena are as conformable to law as any other happenings, only we do not know what the laws are. Chapter 9. Changing Concepts during the first 10 or 12 years of my experimentation, I made use of my material only in brief reports or in letters to Flower and others of my friends. I wished to be known as a fictionist and historian, not as an advocate of psychic research. After all, my pursuit of spooks was only a subsidiary interest, something to pursue in my leisure hours. I had no desire to become branded as a propagandist for any cause. My best advisor said, your report will be all the more valuable if it remains the statement of a literary man's convictions. There was force in this suggestion, and so I kept the subject out of my list of lectures and out of my magazine articles for nearly ten years. But I had in mind to write sometime a novel with mediumship as its main theme. It was not until 1903, however, that the weight of my garnered notes and impressions led me to begin their use in such a story. In 1904, I submitted to Harper's, my publishers, a manuscript which I had written under the title The Tyranny of the Dark. Somewhat to my surprise, it was accepted for immediate use as a serial in Harper's Weekly. It was the story of a girl whose parents, having discovered her mediumistic power, set her aside as an instrument of communication between the living and the dead, denying her the companionship and recreations natural to childhood. She was forced to sit long hours in the dark, surrounded by solemn elderly people who had little regard for her pain and disgust. Her mother said, God has made you a special servant. You are different from other girls. You have a sacred gift. To this the girl made piteous reply, I don't want to be different from other girls. I want to be like them. The title of this novel was suggested to me by the confession of one of my aunts, my mother's younger sister, who said to me one day, For two years these spirit forces made my life a hell. I could never get her to tell me the story of her slavery, but her tone implied that it had been a veritable tyranny of the dark. I imagined it to have been similar to that which Mrs. Smiley had described to me. In fact, I discovered in all the mediums I had studied this bondage to a cause. Either they believed it to be their duty to sacrifice themselves, or they had fallen into the way of making it a source of revenue, pitifully small in most cases. They all lived in an atmosphere of suspicion. 
Wherever they went, they were asked to demonstrate, and their work was the only theme of conversation. They soon lost the normal balance of body and mind. They were no longer free agents. In some cases, insanity resulted. The abstract theme of my novel, therefore, had the warrant of my answer report, as well as that of the three most powerful and most intelligent of the mediums with whom I had experimented. The phenomena detailed were taken directly from my notes or from my diary. The theme interested me. As a writer, I argued that this was as legitimate material for a novel as the lives and deeds of the Cheyenne or the Sioux, of whom I had been writing. Furthermore, I had the example of Howells and Henry James, who had turned aside, if you wish to call it so, to deal with this hidden world. While granting the beauty of the books which these two illustrious fictionists had written, I felt that they were both poor and exact facts. I knew that Howells had based his Undiscovered Country, a lovely story, on a few visits to darkroom and very dubious seances, at a time when no opportunity for exact observation had been given. Without hope of approaching the subtlety, the humor, and the grace of his book, I felt that I could contribute something to American fiction which he and James had left unsaid. To my editors, I wrote, quote, I regard this theme as a legitimate and interesting literary problem. The tyranny of the dark is based on accurate observation. It is wholly different in tone and treatment from any other novel dealing with the subject. Every test which I therein describe I have myself employed. I hope, however, that its scientific accuracy will not interfere with its acceptance as a work of fiction. It is a novel and not a biography or a treatise. Its characters are wholly imaginary." End quote. This story published as a serial was well received by the public and brought me many letters from women who had been similarly devoted. One of these was from the daughter of a nationally known spiritualist. I quoted in confirmation of my theme and in support of the title of my novel as well as of its ending. She wrote, quote, Early in the 50s, my father took up the subject of spiritualism with all his heart and as a result was persecuted, ridiculed, and lampooned. He was too much in earnest to be disturbed. About that time, I, as a motherless schoolgirl, undertook to keep house for him. I soon found, much to my chagrin, that I was what was called a medium. I fought it for a year, my father being unaware of it. Then it became known to him, and I decided to give part of my life to it. I courted the severest investigation by outsiders. For ten years I was avoided and shunned as dangerous, and in the end my health gave out, and for another ten years I had not the least indication of any sort of manifestations. At last I went to the mountains of North Carolina. There I lived outdoors and rode horseback and suddenly the psychic power returned. Ever since I've been called upon from all quarters for advice as to how to treat the subject and my aim has been to instill common sense and reason." End quote. Here was the precise problem which I had made the chief basis of my novel. In 1905, Harper and Brothers brought the novel out in book form and sent out many copies to writers and critics who had expressed a special interest in it. This brought in many other letters, a few of them critical, some demanding why I had not committed myself to the spirit hypothesis. These letters of value were showing a change in the attitude of academic experts. One of the most amusing of the letters was from my old friend and fellow investigator, Amos E. Dolbear of Tufts College. Quote, I was delighted the other day to receive from you a copy of your book, The Tyranny of the Dark. Bless me, what a name for a book. Down I sat in my spare hours for a day or two and read it through in the same room where we had those tyrannous happenings twelve years ago. I got so absorbed in your story that every little noise gave me a start. Wilbur was expected and I would have welcomed him heartily. That delicate finger high on the window, that horn touching my forehead and the voice saying, I ain't dead, and the alarm clock suddenly stopping and the candy box being brought to the table. Every happening is a mystery until it is explained by a deeper mystery." End quote. I ask the reader's attention to that last sentence. The scientist, who was a large figure in my story, was suggested by my good friend, Dr. T.M. Pruden, bacteriologist in New York, who had been my companion on the trail in Arizona and whose bug farm I had visited. From him came a letter equally jocose, quote, I have enjoyed the tyranny of the dark mightily, all the more because you were good enough to inscribe a copy for me. Of course, you storytelling folk wouldn't scruple to make a promising scientific man drop his career like a hot potato just as soon as an alluring bit of femininity appears upon his horizon. Think what that chap might have done for science if you had been willing to let him alone with his ideas. But there would have been no story, so you may be absolved." End quote. He had no criticism to offer of my scientific statements, however. The value of the book as a novel was of more concern to me, and when Israel Zangwill called it quote unquote, the most engrossing book you have written, I was wholly reassured. He went on to say, quote, 
You hold the balance so impartially that you achieve all the thrill of a detective novel. I have met all the circle to which you refer, Crooks, Lodge, and others, at the house of my father-in-law, Professor Ayrton, who also read your book with keen interest." End quote. With these judgments from two experts, one a distinguished critic and fellow novelist and the other a distinguished man of science, I was fortified against attack. While at work on this manuscript, I had written William James asking if he had any new material for me. In his reply, he said, quote, I have myself had no direct contact with mediums for many years, and am still in a state of bafflement as to all these phenomena. It seems as if they were intended deliberately by the Almighty never to either be proved or disproved definitely. I wish I had your experience. There are waves of public interest. It may be that there is just now an ebb, but there will sometime again be a flood, and things will hitch a little forward. Practically, I'm quite out of it, haven't the time or energy." End quote. His letter confirmed me on my theory of psychic waves or cycles. I had sent a personal copy to William Stead, editor of the English Review of Reviews. His acknowledgement indicates the thoroughgoing spiritualist who recognizes no ebbs in spirit progress. Quote, I've just finished making a review of your most interesting and suggestive book on the tyranny of the dark. I hope you'll bring out a sequel when your own ideas are a little clearer on the subject. As you have left it, the story is an ethical outrage. The destruction of such a human telescope into the great beyond as Viola is painted, merely to provide a very self-sufficient dogmatic prig of a young biologist with a wife, is an offense against ethics, against science, against the sense of proportion. The ethical outrage to me is that of making this girl a telescope. I quite agree that it would have been criminal to allow her to remain in Colorado with Clark and Pratt, but that is a very different thing from destroying her mediumship which you have been bent upon doing. There is no difficulty if you complete your task by making him realize when married the crime he has committed in restoring Viola to her proper mission, seeing to it that she always keeps possession of the key of her own piano. Some would say her proper mission was motherhood. The trouble with Viola was that she, being a great natural psychic, instead of being carefully trained and taught that the first law of safety is to be the keeper of her own house so that the spirits can only enter her with permission and remain only so long as she pleases, was handed over to the absolute control of the unseen. No one can be trusted with such ruthless power, certainly not the disembodied dead. But this was an abuse which earlier could have been remedied. The girl was healthy. Clark had gone. Her mother was quite intelligent enough to see that there must be moderation in communication. After all, we are living on this plane. I enclose you a very sensible discourse on the subject of the dangers of obsession. I notice you do not touch upon the phenomenon of the double. It is the most interesting of all, and to my mind of absolutely indisputable reality. Pray pardon the unceremonious freedom of this letter. I like your book and I think it will do good." End quote. In my response, I admitted that my story offered no solution. Quote, it is an advance on the mediumship novels of Howells and James only in that it states a belief in the facts of mediumship. End quote. I did not say, as I was tempted to, that his use of the words human telescope was abhorrent to me, voicing as it did the selfish desires of the bereaved who were willing to violate a young life for their consolement. After this critical estimate of Stead, I welcomed a letter of praise from a fellow novelist, Eden Philpotts, who thanked me for the book and said, quote, You bring great store of knowledge to the task. I would only offer one criticism, and that with deference, since to criticize a kindly gift may be discourteous. But I think your biologist would not have animadverted against the honored name of Ernst Hackle. He is no dogmatist, and where he permits himself to assent, you shall find fifty years of amazingly close and patient study behind the assertion. Can it be that your scientists did not know the evolution of man? I do not quite grasp what becomes of the spirits when the end of your book is reached. Is the hero's will stronger than theirs? If they were real ghosts, as of course you imply, why did they abandon their notable determination to regenerate the world through the heroin? No one knows why this power comes and goes. End quote. This letter was a surprise. I did not know that Phil Potts was in any degree interested in psychic matters. Sir Oliver Lodge's reply was cautious. In a letter to my publishers dated May 24, 1905, he says, quote, I am rather struck with the book you sent me. The tyranny of the dark indicates more knowledge and sympathy with several sides of the question of psychophysical phenomena than is customary in authors of fiction. On the whole, it should be instructive to the average reader since it represents in many respects fairly the spiritualistic attitude and also represents fairly some aspects of the scientific attitude. It is too much to expect that either representation can be quite lifelike or satisfactory to the persons concerned. 
but still on the whole it represents a genuine amount of information and a somewhat remarkable knack of sympathetically depicting opposite sides to a question and holding the balance fairly even between them." End quote. W. H. Malick, another English author, wrote that he had been contemplating a novel dealing with some of the well-known abnormal conditions of the brain. Not precisely those introduced by yourself, he explained, but others more amenable to ordinary scientific interpretation. I must congratulate you on the skill with which in more than one passage you sum up the scientific view of the extreme complexity of the human brain with all its latent and stored up ancestral contents. I have quoted these correspondents not for their comment on the value of the story, but to present a picture of the attitude of literary and scientific men 30 years ago. Not merely toward psychic research, but toward the physical universe. At the suggestion of my publishers, I composed an open letter designed to meet some of the criticisms which came in. Quote, those who complain of me for only hitting the high places are forgetting that my story is, after all, a romance, intended to be diverting rather than informing. It is a study of life precisely as my Hesper is a study of life. I have not departed from my method. I have merely delineated certain characters who, while differing little externally from their neighbors, move in a world of mystery, associating with those whom we call the dead on gentle and respectful terms. Such characters are as legitimate in fiction as any other individuals holding to a different rule of living. As a writer, I found these confiding folk of the utmost interest, and in certain conversations I have tried to present their theories without exaggeration. However, to come back to my original explanation, the tyranny of the dark is a story whose first aim is to interest by delineating a phase of modern life, and secondly, to picture the essential martyrdom involved in mediumship. As to the scope and direction of the chapters, the quality of this or that scene, I can only say that my guide, old subliminal consciousness, ran that way. Without claiming anything epoch-making in this volume, I think I may say that it has definitely advanced the serious study of mediumship. It has won for me the goodwill of the psychics, especially those who are willing to suffer for the good of the cause. The death blow to spiritualism will not be dealt by those who ridicule the testimony of Lodge and Lombroso. It will come, if it comes, from the inside, by a new interpretation of ancient facts. Arrogation of superior intelligence, smartness, is the main characteristic of the assaults on the reports of Crooks and Roche. If I had only been there, as the thought expressed or implied in most of the books by these critics, some of whom get their living by doing stunts for pay. Personally, I prefer to consider the word of the scientific man who is sacrificing his time, his health, and his reputation in the effort to solve a persistent mystery than the snap judgment of a professional conjurer or even that of an objector on the sidelines. I take no account of the academic skeptics, the men who say nothing mysterious ever happens in my presence and who are so cocksure of their penetration and judgment that they decline to investigate for themselves, delighting to sit in judgment of those who carefully and painstakingly pursue the problem. If these fault finders condescend to take part in an experiment, they do so with a sneer, expecting to be instantly convinced of fraud on the part of the psychic. The credulous weakness of distinguished scientists who have been patiently experimenting for years in their laboratories earnestly trying to solve the mystery is lightly assumed. The office of these professional doubters seems to be that of writing books to satisfy those who say, I told you so. And yet, whenever a serious skeptic goes into prolonged investigation to accept facts, he ends as Lombroso did, in a conviction that the phenomena exist, whatever reserves he may hold concerning their interpretation. Mediumship appears to be a negative state, a giving up of control. Psychics only partially govern their manifestations. When they claim to do so, they are not mediums, but wonder workers. This being granted, it is evident that no expert can rush in upon a true medium and club the secret out of him. Investigation is not so simple as that." End quote. Referring back to another sort of thinker, one who affects to despise the physical side of mediumship as though there could be a physical effect without a psychical cause, I added, quote, These spiritists speak of matter and material phenomena with scorn, as if they were somehow less honorable, less to be trusted than spirit. And curiously enough, they join forces with the critics who ridicule Crooks and Zollner, forgetting that all matter is at bottom as mysterious as spirit, and that the man who concerns himself with the physical side of mediumship is, or may be, just as devout a worshipper of reality as the spiritist. The investigator should be a judge, not an advocate. So far as I am able, I shall present the evidence in a spirit of fairness, and especially do I wish to promulgate the philosophy which acknowledges nothing supernatural. Facts are known or unknown. They can't be above or beyond nature. They may be supernormal, that is to say unusual, and new to our senses. If a ghost really walks, why be alarmed about it? If an astral hand touches you, why shrink and cry out? It is a natural phenomenon, startling only because it is new and not understood." End quote. I concluded my statement by quoting another letter from William James, quote, 
One who takes part in a good sitting has usually a livelier sense both of the reality and of the importance of the communication than one who merely reads the record. Active relations with the thing are required to bring the reality home to us. It is a lack of participation long and careful which invalidates criticism of psychical researchers of today." End quote. These and many other letters combined with the reviews brought to my publishers as to me a measure of satisfaction. The book notwithstanding its controversial matter had won a great many readers and had added something to the store of psychic research material. At the moment I vowed never to write another page on this controversial and engrossing subject. You've been listening to Classic Paranormal's reading of 40 Years of Psychic Research by Hamelin Garland. This was the third installment. Be sure to click into the succeeding episodes until the book is complete. Until then, followers of the freaky, aficionados of the afterworldly, connoisseurs of the creepy, stay spooky. Before you go, consider subscribing to my new podcast, Classic Paranormal. It's a clearinghouse for lost real-life accounts of true ghost stories. It's found on Apple Podcasts. Go there now if you're interested in enigmatic tales, chilling true accounts, chronicles from cases of the past that time has forgotten, but that the modern person who likes relaxing by a campfire swapping ghost stories might appreciate. As I said, the new podcast I'm launching is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and there's a link in the description below on this video.